everyone. Welcome to another one of our Lee's Lessons Masterclass. Today we're talking prospecting and specifically getting in the door with elusive prospects. So thank you all for joining us. We'll kick things off with our intro of our wonderful speaker, as you can see here, Lee Sauls, um, in just a moment, but I want to run through some housekeeping items because we have a lot on the table for today. Um, so if you are experiencing any technical issues with this webinar, we are producing this and on a web-based platform. So this webinar may have some glitchy, could have some technical issues, could have some connectivity issues. We're hoping that there, there's not gonna be any of that for you, but let us know using the Q&A chat if you're experiencing any of those issues. A quick, a couple quick tips is just refreshing your window. That tends to help maybe closing down some of your windows. Um, slower Wi-Fi will potentially uh, give you some issues there. But feel free to use the Q&A chat to let us know if you have any issues and we will do the best that we can to alleviate them. We do have a team member that's on monitoring that chat. Um, also use that Q&A chat to let us know if you have any questions for our wonderful speaker today. We will uh, be answering those questions at the end of our session. So keep those, feel free to submit them as they come up, um, but we will answer them at the end. You will receive a recording of this webinar within 48 hours after we conclude today. We have a variety of resources that are sitting right below our window. Um, we will call them out, uh, but feel free to check them out if you'd like to, but we'll call them out throughout the session, give you some context around them and how to use them. Uh, those resources will also be in the email that you'll get the recording in. So we'll call that out as well. Um, but also during this session, our last somewhat last housekeeping item, we're going to be sending off some polls. So polls are going to pop up right in the uh, window to, I believe, the left of our of our speaker window or of our video window, um, where you're seeing the housekeeping slide right now. So you'll be able to interact with it right within that window. I'll give you some prompts as they come up. Um, so you'll be ready for them. But thank you all for joining us. Our last housekeeping item for today is Zoom Info is a publicly traded company. This presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Any buying decisions you make should be made based only upon currently available products and offerings. This is our complete safe harbor statement displayed here. It's also in the resource list if you would like to read the fine print. Um, I wouldn't advise it, but if you want to, go for it. Um, all righty. So we have a fantastic speaker, as you guys are probably all aware. Lee Sauls is a leading sales management strategist and founder of Sales Architects. He is the best-selling author of six business books, including Sales Differentiation and his newest book, Sell Different, which is shown here for your viewing pleasure. Um, you can check that out and we'll give you a, a place to check that out and potentially purchase it. Um, Lee's, Lee was recently named 2022 Speaker of the Year by the Institute of Sales Excellence. Congrats, Lee. Um, he has helped hundreds of companies in various industries and sizes create marketplace disruption by leveraging sales differentiation, leading to explosive profitable growth. He is also a featured columnist in the Business Journal, a member of the Sales Education Foundation Advisory Board, and serves as the program advisor to the Kansas State University National Strategic Selling Institute. Woo. He does a lot, guys. So he's got a lot, a lot of experience, a lot of great in information to give us today. Um, so in today's masterclass, Lee will share strategies to reach elusive prospects. So Lee, let's let's kick things off. Let's get started. Well, hang on, hang on, Rebecca. We can't get okay. started yet. If there, if you've been to my masterclasses before, you know what a great job Rebecca does. It's Rebecca's birthday. You need to go into the chat and wish her a happy birthday. So take a moment and wish Rebecca a happy birthday. Now we're ready to get started. Okay, thank you, Lee. Thank you, I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Awesome, okay, so when we talk about prospecting, it yeah. makes sense to start off by understanding the competitive landscape. Um, who is the toughest competitor sales people face today? Ah, jumping in with one of my favorite questions to ask sales people. Love asking them, who's your toughest competitor? And, and I ask this question a lot of times in my keynotes, and no one ever gets this right. They immediately think of three players in their space. And I'll tell them, you know, certainly those are tough competitors, but there's one even tougher. Then someone gets a little snarky and they go, oh, you mean that old sales trainer one, the status quo, the choice to do nothing. Also a tough competitor, but there's one even tougher. Then the room goes quiet for a moment and they're trying to figure it out. And someone will shout out, me, if I don't have the right mindset, I can be my toughest competitor. 
And, and I'll give you a little side note as far as mindset goes. Um, if you read Sell Different, you know in Chapter 1 I tell the story of my son, Stephen. Yesterday was his final uh, college baseball game of the season, and there was a rain delay, and I was talking to him at the concession stand. He says, Dad, you know, bat just feels heavy today. He grabs another player's bat, gets up, and his last swing of the season was a two-run home run. Mindset is super important. If you believe you can't sell, you're right. If you believe you can sell, you're right. But guess what? That's still not your toughest competitor. There's one even tougher, even more formidable. And I've never had anyone guess who it is. If, unless you read Sell Different, then you know the answer. So here comes the big reveal. The toughest competitor you face is, little drum roll, it's every salesperson calling on the same person you are trying to get a meeting. See, we're egocentric when we think about the competitive landscape. We only see it from our side of the desk. Well, let's flip it to their side, the prospect side of the desk. So let's say you're calling on CIOs to sell outsourced help desk services. CIOs have this broad purview of responsibility, right? So they're getting calls and emails representing that entire spectrum of responsibilities and beyond. So they're getting prospecting calls from salespeople selling hardware, software, outsourcing, staffing, on and on and on. Every one of them is trying to sell that CIO the same thing, a meeting. Now, I was a history major in college and went to school in SUNY Binghamton. And I'll share with you a business fact that I learned while I was in college. You may not know this. In the entire history of business, there has never been an executive hired for the sole purpose of meeting with salespeople every hour on the hour, not even procurement officers. It's never happened. It'll never happen. So here's the really bad news. I know you come to my programs, you want me to build you up, but I got some really bad news to share. You aren't competing against a few players in your space. You're competing against hundreds, maybe even thousands of salespeople trying to get a meeting with this individual. So it's a competition for FaceTime. No, not the Apple technology. I mean, the ability to have a meeting with a prospect. Because here's what we all know. If there's no meeting, there's no proposal. No proposal, no win, no win, no commission check. So understanding who your toughest competitor is allows you to develop strategies to defeat it. Now, knowing the level of competition we face tells us we need to stand out when we reach out, we need to be persistent, and we need to be creative in both our messaging and our strategy to reach that individual to get the meeting. All right, all right. So salespeople, if you did not know that as who is the biggest competitor for salespeople that they face right now, you should definitely get Lee's book. Um, check that out and read that fully. We'll, we'll let you know. There's a link in the resource list that you can check out um, to be able to get you to that book. All right, Lee, so the subject of cold calling is controversial. We talk about it a lot here at Zoom Info, cold, warm, all that fun stuff. What's the current state of affairs in cold calling? Do you do it? Do you not do it? What's the deal there? Yeah, well, we just talked about our toughest competitor and the hundreds, maybe even thousands of salespeople calling the same person we are. And that prospect's job isn't just to meet with salespeople. So should we just call into them? I don't need to answer that question. My friends at the Ring Group have answered that for us. They recently conducted a study where they asked executives if they had ever taken a meeting with a salesperson who had reached out to them through some sort of traditional prospecting means. So here's my question for you. What percentage of executives said, yes, I've taken a meeting with a salesperson that reached out to me through traditional prospecting? So Rebecca, let's run a poll with our audience. What percentage of executives said, yes, I did. I took a meeting with a salesperson that reached out through traditional prospecting. So audience members, you should see right now um, to the left of our, our, our webinar video um, is the poll. It should say, should give you options of zero to 10%, um, uh, 10 to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75 and 76 to 100% feel free to click right inside of that window and submit your, your guess or your answer. And we'll give the audience a little bit of time. About 20% of the audience has filled it out so far. So we'll get up to 50% and then we'll move on. 
We've got a bunch of people in here being real cheeky about my birthday, but (laughs) I appreciate all of the happy birthdays from everybody in the audience. Um, There's a couple that are congratulating your son too. So um, thank you. For those of you that are submitting your, your answers inside of the Q and a feel free to submit them inside or check the little circle next to the option that you think um, in that range fits the answer that you're submitting in the Q&A. You definitely want to make sure that you get counted for um, your poll submission. Alrighty, we got a little bit, we're about 63%. There's some people still trickling through, but I think we can okay. toss up the Let's results. The results. Let's do it. All right, so we've got 35% of the audience uh, says zero to 10%. Uh, the next one up from that is 10 to 25. Um, and then we've got almost an even split between 51 and six and 76%. See, I get to who read my book because this stat is in the book. <laughs> so we're, we've got a little over 60% of the audience says it's between zero and 25%. So another drum roll. The answer is 82%. 82% of executives said, yes, I've taken a meeting with a salesperson that reached out through traditional prospecting. But the study went a step further. It revealed the key ingredient, the secret sauce to getting that meeting. What was it? Personalization. So what that means is if you're sending generic emails, leaving generic voicemail messages when you're trying to reach people and then you get them live and you're having a generic conversation, you are not going to be in that 82%. So, Rebecca, personalization, that's the key if you're going to be in that 82% group. Do you mind, Can you just remind the audience, some people are asking about the source of that um, survey. Do you mind just reminding sure. people Rain, where it came from? Rain group, R-A-I-N group. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So, moving on. Okay. Uh, you've mentioned... Let me just make sure I'm in the right section here. Okay, you have mentioned the importance of personalization. Obviously, we just talked about that a bunch. How can salespeople personalize their prospecting approach? Yeah, great question. I actually have a chapter in my book, Sales Differentiation, dedicated to this. So imagine it's 2 in the morning. There's a pounding on your front door. It's the police. Rebecca, what did you do? They want to have a conversation with you about a crime that's recently been committed. Now, they don't randomly pick you and your house for this conversation. What do they do? They follow the trail of evidence. They put together a crime theory, which has led them to you for a conversation right now. Can you all see where we're going? A sales crime theory. Every buyer, every single one of them, there's a way to get their business. But we play the game blindfolded. It didn't work for us at the five-year-old kitty birthday party, and it's not working for us in sales. I I love to ask groups of salespeople, raise your hand if you love cold calling. I'm not even going to do a poll because I know the answer. Very rarely does a hand even go up. Guess what? There's someone who hates it more than you. It's the person on the other end of the phone who we make to feel like the sales call of the moment. They know the only reason we're calling is to sell them something they don't want, don't need, so we can get a commission check. Well, the sales crime theory the, uh, the sales crime theory changes the entire prospecting approach. And it's founded in the answer to this question. And you're going to want to write this one down. Get ready. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? Not why should we talk with them? That's egocentric. That's about us. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? So you don't pick up the phone. You don't send a prospecting email until you can answer that question. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? So our first step is to identify the types of sales crime theory evidence that if we came across it would say, ah, they should want to have a conversation with me right now. Rebecca, you want want an example of how this works? Yes, please. Certainly. We aim to please around here. So (laughs) let's say we sell uh, conference room technology. So we ask ourselves, what types of sales crime theory evidence that if we came across it would say to us that they should want to have a conversation with me right now. So in the case of selling uh, conference room technology, we know if they have a relocation, expansion, uh, acquisition, new executive hired, 
they're probably going to be talking about the technology in their conference rooms. Well, since that's what we offer, they should want to have a conversation with me right now. So taking a step back, how you would put this into practice, think about what you're selling. Ask yourself this question. What sales crime theory evidence that if you came across it would say to you, they should want to have a conversation with me right now. And then once you identify those types of sales crime theory evidence, the next investig investigative question to answer is, where can you find out this information? Is it on their website, Google, social media? Can Zoom Info help you? So you put your sleuth hat on, and then you begin that search for information. So let me explain how powerful the sales crime theory strategy is. Let's say you sell technology in a manufacturing environment that reduces operational costs and increases efficiency. And today you come across an interview in the Business Journal with the CEO of ABC Manufacturing and talking about an initiative to reduce operational costs and increase efficiency in their facilities. You now have the sales crime theory evidence to reach out to the head of manufacturing because you know that's who's likely to be placed with that responsibility. So let me give you two scenarios. Salesperson A reaches out to the head of manufacturing and says, you know, since you're the head of manufacturing, you're probably looking for ways to reduce operational costs and increase efficiency in your facilities. Well, that's what my company does. Salesperson B reaches out to the head of manufacturing and says, I just read an interview with your CEO talking about an initiative to reduce operational costs and increase efficiency in your facilities. Since you're the head of manufacturing, I'm guessing that responsibility will be placed on you. Well, we work with manufacturing executives to address those issues. Which one got the meeting? Of course you're saying B. I don't need a poll for that either. B, right? Easy one. Here's the tough question. Who had the better product? Aha! If you didn't believe in the power of the sales crime theory strategy, I can't make it pop more than this. What would you say if I told you? Salesperson A had by far the superior solution, but because of how he sold, never got to the table. How you sell makes all the difference in the world in every step of the sales process, and that sales crime theory strategy helps you get in the door. I love that. Okay, so the sales crime theory approach is, a, is great once you reach someone live, um, but it's pretty tough to reach people these days, especially if you don't have Zoom info. So what suggestions do you have to reach these elusive prospects? Get Zoom info. You just said it. <laughs> That's a great point, Rebecca. It's a great point. We don't think enough about that aspect. When it comes to prospecting, we need to have a strategy for both the qualitative and quantitative components of it. So the sales crime theory that we just talked about, that gives us the qualitative strategy for prospecting, which helps us spark interest. Just as important, we need a strategy to reach elusive prospects, which is the quantitative side. You know, sales is one of the only jobs that's not paid for work. We're paid for effectiveness. We're paid for results. So saying we made a few calls but didn't reach the individual, we've accomplished nothing. So, Rebecca, let's run another poll. How many Ready? attempts do you believe it takes to reach a prospect? How many attempts? So, same deal, everybody. Um, it'll it'll give you the poll. options right inside right inside that slide window to be able to select the poll. So, how many attempts does it take to reach a prospect? You have options between one and four, five and eight, nine and 12, 13 and 16, and 17 and 20. You can engage with the poll right where you see it, selecting the bubbles. If you need to, you might need to scroll to be able to submit it. Um, but again, we'll let the audience uh, choose, or, or at least give us about 50% of the audience to engage with it. So we're at 30% right now. Um, and someone actually made a really good point uh, relating to your conversation, what you were just saying, um, Lee, about specifically talking about McDonald's as a proof of that. So great marketing sells tasteless burgers. Um, and it's, it's true. Okay, we're at 50%. Let's toss this okay. up to the group. Um, so we're saying about, I would say about half or more than half, about 60, almost 70% of the audience says um, between 5 and 12 touches. Right. So well, 
Um, it's kind of a another big reveal here. You ready? According to Gardner, very reputable source, it takes mm-hmm. about 18, one eight, 18 attempts to reach a technology buyer. And I can't imagine that data would be any different for any other type of buyer. Now, notice the word attempts. They didn't mm-hmm. say phone calls or emails or specify any other technique. So if I took my hand and tried to pound a nail into my desk and I failed, hitting it again with my hand isn't the answer. I need to try another way, many other ways, until it works. And the same holds true here. We need to be much more strategic in the quantitative side of our outreach. Now, if you've been to my other master classes, you know you never leave empty handed. So I've got something for you. I put together my 16 day prospecting rhythm that includes a variety of techniques to help you reach elusive prospects. Rebecca, where can they find that? So right below our window here, you should see a resource list. Um, it's a variety of handouts. I think it's actually this first, should be the first handout. Um, it should say lease all 16 day prospecting rhythm. You can click on that. It'll automatically download. You'll also receive it within the recording email or the email you get the recording in. We'll also have that, have this handout there as well for you to be able to download. But yes, right below us, you can download that now. Perfect. Now, as you read through it, you're gonna see it includes several techniques phone calls, emails, using LinkedIn, Outlook invites, et cetera. And you may read this, as many salespeople have said, wow, that's a lot. It is, and I make no apologies for it because it works. As executives get busier and busier, it takes more strategic attempts to reach them. And this 16-day prospecting rhythm is designed for the pursuit of a prospect who you found sales crime theory evidence for and how to reach them for a conversation. So if you think of this, they they work together hand in glove. The sales crime theory strategy is the qualitative side of prospecting and the 16 day prospecting rhythm provides strategy for the quantitative side of the equation. All right, so what's your perspective on leaving a voicemail uh, messages when when you're prospecting? Do you leave them, do you not leave them? Yeah, well, according to Ringlead, over 80% of inbound calls go to voicemail. I I think it's even higher than that, right? We got caller ID. If we don't recognize a number, we don't answer the phone. And when I ask salespeople about leaving voicemails from prospecting, it's, it's a hot topic. I mean, there's passion in both sides of the aisle. Leave a message. Don't leave a message. So I'm going to show my age here. I'm 53. I remember back in the 70s and 80s, the Miller Lite commercials. Tastes great, less filling. That's what it's like when I talk with salespeople about this voicemail topic. Well, let me ask you this. Imagine after this masterclass, you check your voicemail, and there's a message from a salesperson who says, I've got $10,000 for you. Call me back. When I ask my audiences to raise their hands, if you'd call them back, very few hands go up. What if there was a message from a salesperson that said, I can cut your cell phone bills in half, call me. Again, very few if any hands go up. Third try, there's a message that says, I can reduce your interest rates by 5%, let's talk. And again, very few if any hands go up. So think about this, I've offered you money. I've offered to reduce your costs and still, I can't get most people to call me back. What could I possibly say in a voicemail message to get a return call? The answer is nothing, nothing. Most salespeople I talk with, when we talk about voicemail, they're so frustrated. I left so many messages, nobody's calling me back. Guess what? They ain't calling you back unless one thing is happening. There's only one way you get a return call from a voicemail. That's if you have serendipity taking place. Well, what does that mean? You happen to leave me a message about reducing cell phone costs, and at the same time, I'm looking at my bill and considering a change in provider. That's the only way it happens. So now you're thinking, Lee Sauls is anti-voicemail message when prospecting. I'm gonna go tell my manager, never leave a voicemail message when prospecting. Don't do that, because you're gonna be wrong. I'm a huge proponent of voicemail. You'll see it's in the prospecting rhythm. But I believe we need to think differently about this medium. Let's take the return call off the table. It ain't happening. Matter of fact, you even say that in your message. I'm not expecting you to call me back. Boy, that's different than the hundreds of other salespeople calling on them. You stand out. And we're going to use voicemail, not to get a return call, but to wet their whistle, spark intrigue, 
so that when we connect with them live, they have context for the conversation. Voicemail is a wonderful component. It's an important component of the quantitative side of your prospecting strategy. But keep it short, on point. Like, don't waste valuable seconds saying, I hope you're having a great day, because you just wasted three seconds, and they're not going to listen to a message very long. And you don't know them. They don't know you. They know you really don't care that they're having a great day or not. So get to the point fast in that voicemail message. Now, when you look at my 16-day prospecting rhythm, you'll notice there are times when you leave voicemails and times when you don't. The sales crime theory evidence help you, helps you craft that voicemail message to spark the intrigue you need for the engagement when you connect with them live. <clears throat> All right. Awesome. Okay. So can you talk about the outlook component of the prospecting or prospect rhythm? Sure. I can't take credit for that one. A salesperson who worked for me for a number of years developed this approach and you'll see it as part of the 16 day prospecting rhythm on day seven and 15. See the beauty of outlook is you can send an invite to anyone and it automatically appears in their calendar, whether they accept it or not. So let's talk about how to best use that component. Imagine you're leaving a voicemail message and you let them know when you're going to call back. If you have their email address, you can send an invite for that day and time. Now you're in their calendar. Now you may be thinking, boy, that's not always going to work. I agree with you 100%. Nothing I've shared is going to work 100% of the time. Nothing you hear from anyone's going to work 100% of the time. If you're looking for that kind of magic, you're never going to find it with me or quite frankly, anyone else. What I would hope you're all looking for is incremental gains to move the needle. That's the magic, moving the needle. If you can reach 5% more prospects using this technique than you did before, isn't that a win? Of course it is. So looking for those incremental gains is what I hope all of you look for when you come to my master classes. So if you think about everything we've talked about today in aggregate, you're gonna move that prospecting needle. And when you multiply that out in your prospecting funnel, a lot more wins, a lot more commission dollars. For sure. So, of course, outbound calls and emails are a part of an overall prospecting strategy. Other than outbound efforts, how can salespeople reach these elusive prospects? Well, let's face it, prospecting is tough. Very few salespeople like it, and it's just one component of an overall business development strategy. A very important one, but it's just one tool in your toolbox. And oftentimes, I find we make sales much more complicated than it needs to be. So I'm gonna share a strategy with you now that I personally guarantee you, that's, that's bold, but I can. I can personally guarantee you will help you find more of your best clients. I call it the If You Were Me business development strategy. Folks, this is a needle mover. Get ready to write this down. First step is to pick 10 of your best clients from your portfolio that align with your target client profile. Oh, you don't have a target client profile? Well, I got something for you. Rebecca, where can they get that tool? It's also in the same section. So right below your window right now, there are, uh, along with the 16 day, there's also the target client profile that's right below. You'll be able to click a link. Um, it'll download for you automatically. It's a, it's a PDF, so you'll be able to download that really quickly, as well as in the follow-up email with the recording, you'll receive that as a link as well there where you can download it. Perfect. And that tool is going to help you have that clarity on who your best clients are. So when I say your 10 best clients, I mean that if you could stick them in a copier as a way to grow your business, you'd do it in a heartbeat. And you're going to reach out to each one of them and have a conversation. You're not sending an email or a text. This is an actual conversation on the phone or Zoom or even in person. And the conversation sounds like this. Rebecca, you've been working with us for a number of years, so you're familiar with what we offer and the quality of what we offer. Now, here comes the big ask. If you were me, what associations would you be active in? What conferences would you attend? What events would you go to? What would you be reading to meet more people like you? Let me say that one more time. If you were me, what associations would you be active in? What conferences would you attend? What events would you go to? What would you be reading to meet more people like you? Sales is an open book test. We make it so much harder than it needs to be. Now, during this conversation, you aren't cross-selling, you're not upselling, you're not asking for referrals, you're not asking them to serve as a reference. 
The sole thing we're doing here is asking them to take our hat, place it on their head for a moment, and provide us with their counsel. That's it. That's all we're doing. And the cues and the question are there to help them think through their recommendations. And you're going to find people are very gracious. They genuinely want to help, but they have to be asked if they're going to do so. Now, the point at the end of the question, to meet more people like you, that strokes their ego. It further invites them to respond and help you. Now, what you do is you have these 10 conversations, you document the findings, and you put together action plans to pursue these new strategies. Uh, Rebecca, do you mind if I share a couple of success stories? I'd love some success stories. I think there's even some people <laughs> looking for... Would. I knew you would. I mean, especially right. the audience. I'm sure they want to hear about your success stories as well. <laughs> All right. I gave this assignment to a consulting client. Have 10 conversations in two weeks, and then we're going to have a debrief call. Just before the debrief call, I get this apology email from their sales manager. Lee, we had a lot of things going on. We only got four conversations done, so we need to reschedule our debrief. But I attached our findings. So then I looked through the document. Four pages of notes from four conversations. There's no need for an apology. That was pure gold. Another great story. Coaching client, individual. Again, tasked with having 10 conversations in two weeks. He got seven done. In one of those conversations, he found out about a technology council in his own backyard that he didn't know existed. And the members were CIOs, ones that he had unsuccessfully attempted to reach through traditional prospecting. And his client says to him, you know, if you'd like, I can bring you as my guest. Yeah, I'm there. Here's the best part. A few months ago, he was given the opportunity to present to this group that prior to executing the If You Were Me strategy, he didn't know existed. Interesting side story with this salesperson, too. He asked one of those uh, If You Were Me questions in person with a CEO sitting next to him. CEO didn't know about the strategy. So that night, I get an email from the CEO that said, Lee, feels like this is the question I've been missing for the last 15 years of my life. Thank you. Watched it in action today. Nearly cried spectacular. And if you don't believe me, I can show you the email that says that. And folks, here's the thing. I'm not asking you to spend money with me or anyone else to put this strategy into practice. It costs you nothing, not even a dime. But this can be the difference maker when you're talking about creatively reaching those elusive prospects. That's awesome. Those are really great success stories, especially when you're, you know, you're asking them to hit 10 and they've only been able to hit seven, but ended up, you know, over expectations of what they were able to, to do with that. Um, that's phenomenal. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. So you mentioned referrals. So let's, let's talk about referrals. What do oh, sure. referrals or where do we, sorry, where do referrals fit in an overall prospecting strategy? Oh, okay. Rebecca, have I told you about Marie and Tony? Mm, maybe. I don't think oh, so. Let me tell you about them now. So during the dot-com boom, I built a sales force for a technology training company in the D.C. metro area. And we had three sales teams, corporate, federal, and career changer. And career changers were individuals who saw the opportunities in the IT world and they wanted in. And for that sales team, we'd advertise in the Sunday edition of the Washington Post to generate leads, you know, to make the phones ring on Monday. And based on where the ad appeared, that determined the lead flow for the week. If it was above the fold on the front page of the employment section, tons of leads. If it fell below the fold, lead flow dropped by 50%. And then there were these weeks, oh, this was bad. There were these weeks when the post didn't allow ads on the front page and you drop to page three and we get about 10% of the lead flow. And when those days, Rebecca, <laughs> I didn't want to come to work on Monday because I knew there was gonna be a line of salespeople outside my office already with excuses for their performance because of ad placement. But they weren't all there. Not all the salespeople. Marie and Tony were never there, never complaining about ads. After they had been on the team for six months, they had built their business on referrals. They were completely self-sufficient, which should be every salesperson's goal, to be self-sufficient. They looked at the company-generated leads as gravy. Their referrals were the meat. And we all know that referral leads convert into clients at a higher rate with a shorter sales cycle. Why? Trust. When going through a buying process, decision influencers attempt to validate the claims that we make. And validations is much, much easier for them to do when they're referred by a trusted source like a family member, friend, or, or colleague. But the bigger picture here is the goal of self-sufficiency. 
even if you're with a company that doesn't generate leads for you. Traditional cold calling, traditional prospecting is tough. Why do it any more than you have to? So once you've built critical mass in, in your account portfolio, the key is to leverage those relationships into future deals. We talked about the if you were me strategy as one of those. Another is acquiring referral leads from them, again, as a way to reach those elusive prospects. All right, so how can salespeople get more referrals? I'm sure you have yeah, some wouldn't great that be examples. Nice? <laughs> yeah, that would be wonderful. Well, the first step is to understand that there are two types of referrals, passive and active. So passive referral leads are those generated without any effort of the company or the salesperson. It's a happy client who passes along a salesperson's contact information to someone who expresses interest. And then that person contacts the salesperson because they love the product, and, and that leads to a new sale. Active referral leads are generated both through the company and salesperson. An active referral campaign means salespeople are soliciting this lead type. Not enough salespeople do this. See, when I ask salespeople about the referrals that they're getting, most of them tell me stories about passive ones. Very rare that I hear a dedicated campaign for active referrals. And quite frankly, the old expression rings true. If you don't ask, you don't get. IDC, a global marketing intelligence firm, they found that 73% of executives prefer to work with salespeople referred by someone that they know. 73% said that. So active referral lead generation, it's not a nice to have. It's a must have. But let's talk about how we ask for referrals. Two classrooms side by side, two teachers teaching the exact same lesson equally proficiently. First teacher finishes the lesson, looks at her students and says, any questions? Not one student, not one raises their hand. Teacher in the second classroom taught the lesson equally as well, finishes at the same time, looks out at her students and asks, what questions can I answer for you? And spends the next 30 minutes fielding questions from her students. Why am I telling you this story? Well, it parallels the way salespeople ask for referrals. They say some variation of, do you know of anyone who'd be interested in what we offer? What do we always hear? Can't think of anyone, but I'll call you if I do. Folks, that call's not coming, not gonna happen. So here's a referral request strategy that does work. Not 100% of the time, but it's certainly more effective. We're gonna make a subtle shift in how we ask for referrals, and that shift will change the number of actor referral leads that you generate. Try asking it this way. Given what you know about what we do, who do you know who would also be interested in what we offer? I'll say that again. Given what you know about what we do, who do you know who would also be interested in what we offer? Who do you know suggests they know someone, even multiple people who would be interested in what you offer? It's illogical to answer that with a yes, no response based on how it's phrased. Try it. You'll be amazed at that little change in how you ask the question leads to more active referral leads. Again, we're, I'm not telling you you're going to all of a sudden get a gazillion of them. You're going to get more than what you have today. And our goal is to move the needle. And that's a needle mover. Awesome. Awesome. This is a lot. You covered a lot, um, a lot of great information today. And so can you just sum it up for the audience here? What is maybe something that one takeaway or multiple takeaways are the sum of, of what you mentioned today? Sure. So if you think about where we started today, we talked about understanding our toughest competitor, which is all the salespeople calling the same person we are trying to get their attention to procure a meeting. Once we had that clarity, we recognized that every aspect of business development needs a strategic approach. We talked about the sales crime theory strategy as a way to develop an engagement approach for the qualitative outreach. We also talked about the importance of strategy for the quantitative part of prospecting and got into the discussion around the 16-day prospecting rhythm. We talked about the if you were me strategy. It was another way to reach elusive prospects by leveraging the clients you already have. And then we finish by talking about active referral leads as another way to reach those elusive prospects. Everything that I've talked about here today is covered in my two books, Sales Differentiation and Sell Different in much greater detail than, than what we've talked about here. Yeah, so audience members definitely below in the resource list, there is a link to the book um, as well as Lee, do you wanna mention the actual link itself and, and any kind of add-ons they might get if they oh, go sure. to that link. 
Sure. If you go to selldifferentbook.com, I couldn't get selldifferent.com. It's selldifferentbook.com. You can actually download the first chapter free, uh, both the audio version and the, um, the print. Um, and then if you do decide to buy the book wherever you wind up buying it, come back to that page. There's a video series called The Sales Differentiation Minute, Volume 2. Uh, every week for a year, you'll get an email with a link to a video to help you implement what you've read about. Awesome. Awesome. All right, audience members, we have some time here for some questions. Um, not a whole lot of time. We've got some time. We're going to make sure we're cognizant of, of your time as well. Um, if you could, Lee, let's see where we at here. Um, you can get some good questions here. Um, okay, so how do you get in the door with a prospect who is buying from the competition and is quote unquote happy with the current supplier? Any suggestions, advice? I, I like that you put quotes around happy. <laughs> happy, they you know, as well. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. Um, there's actually a strategy. It's actually the last chapter of sales differentiation. It's the happy, satisfied conversation. Um, and so you reach out to someone and they say, we're happy with our current provider. And they're going to expect you to become combative. Don't become combative. Say, that's wonderful to hear. Um, just curious, are you happy or are you satisfied with them? And the most common response you're going to hear back is, what's the difference? Thank you. Now we're in a conversation. Well, if you think of it from a school environment, if you're happy, that's like getting an A on your report card. It means you're exceeding your expectations each and every day. If you're satisfied, that's like getting a C on your report card. It means your minimum basic expectations are being met. So coming back to my question, are you happy or are you satisfied? Most people with that context are going to say satisfied. But you have to have a strategy for both. If they say that they're happy, say, that's great to hear. What is it that they're doing that exceeds your expectations? And the hope is that that's stuff that you look at as table stakes, something you do in the normal course of business. Um, if they're satisfied, then you take them down an exploratory path where you position your meaningful differentiators and ultimately lead to a call to action, which I'm guessing is a, a discovery meeting. Very, very effective strategy. It's in chapter 19 in great detail of sales differentiation. Love it. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, when creating a creating sales for a startup, what would you suggest for the target client profiling? For example, we are missing existing clients for now. Yep. I'm not sure if I fully understand, but fair, fair point. So obviously if you don't have clients, uh, a little harder to do the if you were me strategy. But the target client profile, there's a reason why that business was launched. There has to be someone in mind that they're thinking is going to purchase that product, service, technology, whatever that might be. Um, and so I would go through that initial vision and that target client profile. Those nine components will help you develop much more detailed conversation within your company so that you have clarity on who the right fit is for it. Perfect. Okay. This is another interesting one. When you're a pros it's kind of a twofold question here. Um, so when you're prospecting, how do you differ in your approach with inside sales as opposed to outside sales? So that's part one of it. And then part Wait, two say, of it. Say that, first, say that again, please. Yes. How, how do, do you differentiate differ inside and outside? Yeah, it says, how do you differ in your approach with inside sales as opposed to outside sales? Um, and then the it continuing means, on are that. Are they the ones whole. making the calls or we're, or we're calling on to them? I, I don't, I don't understand the context there. No, I, yeah. Let me read the second part of it to see if that helps. Um, should you have the same strategy with reaching out to those other contacts within a customer who is already your client? Um, I would leverage the relationships that I already have to meet others in the organization but the question you have to ask yourself is why should they introduce you to others? What's in it for them? Mm -hmm. um, doing you a favor isn't the answer because you're a nice guy or, or a woman. That's not the answer. There has to be something for them. For example, it will help them to look good. Um, that That's something that, that would be helpful with that as to why uh, they would want to do that and look for them to open doors for you. I mean, maybe there's a financial piece, for example, in some companies as they look to conquer accounts, expand the influence in an account, that they will um, offer like a 10% savings on the invoice 
if you wind up getting other pieces of the business. So mm -hmm. there could be a financial reason to drive that as well. Awesome. Okay. There's a lot of questions coming in here, audience, so we will do the best that we can to answer them all. If not, I will share the questions with Lee after the fact, and if he is able to, and within his time frame, be able to reach out to you all. So um, know that if we don't get to your question. Um, <clears throat> all right, what, a, <clears throat> excuse me. what about referrals in industries that don't like others, their, mm. quote, their competitors, knowing that they found a new tool that gives them an advantage? Great question. So, for example, if you have Coca-Cola as a client and you go in and say the word Pepsi, you just lost a client. There, there are a lot of industries like that where it's so competitive in nature. Um, so you have to be sensitive to that. So, for example, if you um, when, when you think about the referrals, you would say, obviously, I'm not talking about working with with Pepsi, but name the organizations that you're trying to develop relationships with that they do not see in any way as being competitive with them. Because, of course, if you're providing a solution that helps to make them more competitive, they certainly don't want to arm the, the competition with that. Awesome. Okay. And audience members, there's a lot of you asking for the recording. You will receive the recording within 48 hours after we conclude today. So keep an eye on your inbox. It'll be sent out via email. But I'm, I am trying to answer some of you that are asking. Um, okay. Um, Rebecca, I see one, uh, it's numbered 118 it. from Gerald Francis there. I, I wanted to mention something. Yeah. He, he's talking about that he's making 150 calls and sending more than 150 emails regularly, but not getting any positive response. Um, some said that it's dependent on your mindset. Is that true? Um, mindset certainly a piece, but with that quantity, you know, there, there's, this thing you've all heard about sales, sales is a numbers game, and I don't wholeheartedly uh, believe in that. I think that's a part of it. I love numbers, stats, and all that good stuff. Um, but if if you only see sales through the lens as a numbers game, you treat people like a number. If you're mm -hmm. making 150 calls and sending 150 emails a day, there's no way that you're personalizing that in the level that we've talked about here today. And so that's one of the reasons why you may not be getting a response. Um, as far as the outbound phone call, something to think about. Meetings start on the hour, on the half hour. So make your calls five minutes before the hour or half hour, five minutes after the hour or half hour. And I did put that on the 16-day um, the prospecting rhythm. You'll see a box, and that little note is in there. Awesome. Okay. Um, so many questions coming in here. Um, a lot of a lot of fans. So there's definitely a lot of people um, excited and happy with the book that so far. Um, so there's oh, thank that. You. I appreciate Anything, that. Any questions in here, Lee, that stick out to you that you've seen other than that one? Um, I mean, I can just randoms, but um, here's one. Okay, here's one. When throwing a meeting on a person's calendar while prospecting, do you recommend uh -huh. 15 minutes over the standard 30? Um, also, so start there. Do you recommend 15 minutes versus 30 minutes? I'd, uh, I'd put 10. You put 10. Okay. She's, 10 minutes. They've also said, I've also, I've seen you can more. Even, you can even go, well, you can even go short. You can go for five. If That's the less you're here. asking for, the more likely it is that they're going to accept it. Perfect. Yeah, because he, he did go on to say, I've also seen more and more executive set meetings starting five minutes past the an hour, half hour. Um, so I think that's very effective. Yeah. Very effective it is, and again, nothing we've talked about is going to be something that you say. I went from not getting any to now I'm getting a hundred percent. It's just incremental gains. If you take all the strategies we talked about here today, I'll bet you can move the needle at least ten percent. And if you take that ten percent, multiply that out across your entire sales process, and what that means in your earnings, th those become mega dollars. It's not a ten percent increase in earnings. So there's a couple of people in here talking about gatekeepers. I don't know if you want to take a stab at this, but this okay. one specific um, gate, gatekeepers are becoming more difficult to get around. Many will take messages or say you must email. What do you suggest? Yeah, um, what you just said, Rebecca, is, the, is really the problem. How do we get around a gatekeeper? If I mm -hmm. said to you, how do I get around you? How do you respond to that? You bristle, right? No one wants to feel like someone's trying to get around me. Gatekeepers are often a wealth of information. And if you're respectful of them and you acknowledge that you understand their role, someone has asked them to be a gatekeeper. They didn't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to be a gatekeeper today. 
And if you acknowledge that and ask some questions, what would be the best way to reach so-and-so? How would I share this information in the best way with so-and-so? You'll find that a lot of people, again, nothing's 100%. But if you take that approach, you'll find that more often than not, gatekeepers, when, when you stop thinking of them in that way and you think of them as people that have been given a task and you try to operate within that task, you'll get a better response from them. Awesome. All right. Let's see if we can do maybe one more. Um, I'm looking at um, 134 Brian. from Brian. A lot of these efforts can reasonably come mm -hmm. across as pushy or rude. Any guidance on how to psychologically frame things so as not to have that feeling? So there, there's a lot there. Number one, if in your head, you, in your heart of hearts, you believe that this approach is being pushy, there's your problem. Like when I said mm -hmm. earlier, my son, my son's bat didn't weigh any more yesterday than when he hit the the home runs and the doubles and all that other stuff that he hit all season long. It was how he felt that day. And so he used a different bat. If you believe that this is pushy and rude, and you may say back, oh, I don't think that. But the fact that you put that in your question, in your heart, you probably do think that. Mm -hmm. And if you have something that would help me in some aspect of my life, boy, I'd really appreciate if you got my attention on that issue. But if in your heart you're trying to sell me something you know I don't want, I don't need, just so you can get a commission check, yeah, you are going to have a challenge with the strategy. And quite frankly, if whatever it is you're selling, you really feel that way about it, you may want to think about selling something else. If you genuinely believe that what you have is meaningful, is helpful to others, you should be spreading the gospel and you should make no apologies for that. Awesome. Awesome. I 100% I agree. Um, okay. There's this last question here. I think we can, any, any, maybe not a, a full blown uh, explanation for them, but you can maybe direct them to maybe some of your books or some of your handouts. Um, but this one is asked, I was hired to get clients that haven't bought for years to return to us. Any strategies to get clients back, not new clients, previous clients that have bought from us before, um, but I've stopped. Okay. Um, the first question is, why did they leave? Mm. Right? If they left because you had an issue, pricing, or the worst case scenario is somebody came in and sold a more comprehensive solution and you got knocked out, look for new information, something that's changed. So, for example, no company is perfect, right? We like to think our company is perfect, but none of them are. CEOs know that their companies don't bat a thousand. They make mistakes. Every production has defects. So acknowledge that when you reach out. I know uh, a few years ago when, when we were working together, we had issues with such and such. Here's what we've done since then. And, and your feedback has helped us to improve. Would you be open to not switching to us a conversation? That's all we're asking for. Not asking for a meeting. That's formal. A conversation, it's casual. To be open to a conversation so I can share with you some of the changes that we've made. I never ask them to consider making a change. I just want to share information with them. You know, a lot of times in sales where we get in trouble is we try to take a leap. Sometimes you got to take little baby steps. And in this case, you want to take little baby steps to lead them just to have a conversation, a coffee maybe and to share with them some of the new things that you're doing. You don't know where the conversation is going to take you. Maybe it turns out you aren't a fit for them because their needs have changed, or they say, you know what, our needs have changed, and the things you're doing now make you a better fit today than yesterday. Awesome. All right, audience members, we have th like three minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end that because there's no way – I mean, maybe Lee, he, like, we, could, we could challenge him to give us a really great answer in three minutes, but – or in six minutes, but I think we should give him a little bit of a break. He's provided a lot of great information for us today. And I know that there are a lot of great questions that came through the uh, from you guys in the audience. So know that they will be passed over to Lee and shared with him to be able to, in, in some way, follow up with you. Um, so and, definitely- and I, invite, you know, and I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I have a Lee's Lessons newsletter, it goes out every Tuesday, that has tips and techniques, uh, long lines of the different things we've talked about here today. Um, so that's a great way to, uh,
for us to connect and, and if you like this information to keep seeing it. Awesome. And there was also a bunch of you asking about like email specific stuff. So Zoom Info, we run webinars on a weekly basis. We actually run a, outside of Lee's webinars. We do run others. No, um, no, no, so no, no, no. They only do mine. <laughs> <laughs> so check out, we'll, we'll put a link in the follow-up email for you guys to go to the Zoom Info website to the Resource Center. In there, there's a lot of on-demand webinars that you guys can um, walk, walk through, um, anything email related. We've got a lot in there. So um, we'll, we'll add a little link to the Resource Center there so you guys can check that out. Um, that'll be in the email uh, following up this session. Um, and thank you all for joining us. This was a lot of great information, a really successful webinar in my, my opinion. We thank you all for being here and we hope that you got out of it as much as we did. Um, and check out Lee's book. It's selldifferentbook.com. So definitely check that out. Sell, so, um, yeah, selldifferentbook.com. You're right. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. All righty, everybody. Thank have you, a everyone. great day. Come and back next time. We got exactly. plenty more this year. <laughs> exactly. All right. Have a good one, everybody.